I want to say this up top. If these movies bring you joy, if you empathize with the characters, if you feel seen by the Snyder DC movies, I am very happy for you and I'm not trying to take that away from you. Now, I have made my thoughts on Batman v Superman very clear in the past. On my podcast, mostly nitpicking in previous videos, I'm not a fan. But hey, why bring this up now? Is it because this is late 2020 and for some reason everyone from Marcus at Cosmonaut Variety Hour to Maggie Mayfish to Eric Sophia at Curio has made a video critiquing Batman v Superman or Zack Snyder? Nope. In fact, it's much weirder than that. This entire video idea came from a Twitter post I came across the other day. Someone posted a picture of Batman v Superman's Jimmy Olsen and wrote, BVS was the first time Jimmy Olsen actually served a purpose, good night. And in case you don't remember, which I do not fault you for at all, this is Jimmy Olsen. He shows up for a little less than a minute in the beginning of Batman v Superman as Lois's photographer. It is revealed that Jimmy is actually part of the CIA and he is unceremoniously killed. He is only called Jimmy Olsen in the credits and then in the extended edition, Jimmy is actually named in the movie, but that's about it. So this, getting killed, was the purpose he served. Putting Lois in danger that she was already in, but okay, I guess technically that serves a purpose in that it moves the story forward, except like barely, but still. That brings you to the question, what purpose should Jimmy Olsen serve? Is that the only time he's ever served a purpose? Why even bother with Jimmy Olsen at all? And how could Batman v Superman have benefited from an appearance by Superman's best friend. Well, Nando, in order to answer that question, we have to take a better look at Jimmy's origin and how he's been used since then. Oh, hey, Laron. Oh, right, sorry, everyone. This is Laron Reedus. He runs the YouTube channel Reedus101, where he analyzes various movies and TV, along with videos on various geek-related pop culture. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, no problem. It's an honor to be here to talk about a topic that Scott over at NerdSync probably knows 10 times more than I do, but I am going to do my best. Oh, I'm sure you'll do great. So what is it about Jimmy Olsen's origin that we need to know to understand why Snyder thinks he doesn't serve a purpose? Well, that has a lot to do with how DC utilized him upon his creation. You see, Jimmy was sort of this pseudo-prototype for how characters were made canon in DC Comics continuity outside of the books, like Harley Quinn, for example. There was a character in the Golden Age Superman comics with a tie that was known as an office boy, but Jimmy wasn't introduced into the Superman mythos by name until 1940 in the radio show The Adventures of Superman. Afterwards, Superman creator Siegel and Schuster started incorporating him into the comics back when they were working on the book, and the rest is history. Since then, Jimmy's been marketed as Superman's pal, even before getting his own book titled exactly that. He looked at Clark and Lois as role models during his quote-unquote internship at the Daily Planet. He got into just as much trouble as Lois did that required Superman to get him out of and was given special access to Superman through a specially made wristwatch that I am absolutely sure was created just to sell toys. Basically, Jimmy Olsen was the self-insert for a lot of the young male child readers of Superman before the concept of sidekicks was made popular by the introduction of Robin the Boy Wonder in Batman's takeover of Detective Comics, beating Captain America's sidekick Bucky Barnes by a year. When Jimmy got his own book during the Silver Age of Comics, it was definitely more along the line of wholesome fun for DC, kinda like when they gave Lois her own book once upon a time. Jimmy got into various hijinks, both involving and not involving Superman's presence, a lot of them involving gorillas for some strange reason. That nowadays would remind a lot of us who grew up on old school Cartoon Network or Boomerang of plots they would use for Jabberjaw or Josie and the Pussycats. And it's because of this and the fact that Jimmy would need saving just as much as Lois would in the stories of the previous era, a lot of people, Zack Snyder included, kinda only see Jimmy as this character that doesn't really factor that much into Superman's core essence. 
Not even Richard Donner's classic Superman the movie or the other sequels and spinoffs following that feature Jimmy Olsen do him justice in that regard. Not only is he pictured as someone who constantly needs saving, but the fact that Perry and Lois treated him like this cute but annoying stray dog that followed them home that won't stop barking didn't really help. Now originally, I just chalked up the quote unquote reconstruction of Olsen's cameo in the beginning of Dawn of Justice as something that was left over from David Goyer's original script. You know, before Ben Affleck negotiated Chris Terrio to come on board and try and make it better. And as the scene after the Senate hearing when Superman states that he didn't see the bomb in the wheelchair because he chose not to see it has shown us, there's a lot of Goyer that still remained in the screenplay after Terrio took over. But upon also being informed of what Snyder said regarding the use of Olsen, along with considering the era of DC Comics he's actually a fan of, it kinda makes sense that all Zack could see from Jimmy's character were the aspects of him being too bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to find a place for him in Dawn of Justice as it currently exists. It's a bit sad that he couldn't see a better way of using Jimmy when there are just so many good examples out there. Like Superman Returns, for instance. Alright, I'ma head out. Wait, 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 Laurent, where are you going? Listen, Nando, I've covered so much regarding that living embodiment of a temper tantrum director that I'm just about singered out at this point. Just like the rest of Hollywood. So, I completely get that. I totally understand. Brian Singer seems like a real bad dude, but just hear me out this time. There is a very good point here that kind of plays into what you were saying about how to use Jimmy Olsen the right way. You have 62 seconds. That's all I need. All right. Now, Superman Returns has its problems, but the more distance I have from it, the more I appreciate it. I believe Superman Returns not only understood what makes Clark, Lois, and Lex tick, but it also understood the small stuff. In Superman Returns, Clark Kent has been away from Earth on a mission to find what he believes may be Krypton, but he's ultimately unsuccessful because Krypton was indeed destroyed, so Clark returns to Earth and is forced to go back to work at the Daily Planet. During his introduction, Clark is pushed around, politely trying to get through a rude crowd of metropolins, and he's a little bombed. But then he sees Jimmy Olsen, and in this moment, Clark sees a friendly face. And Clark smiles. In this moment, Jimmy Olsen serves more of a purpose than CIA Jimmy ever did. He is a friend. Clark is not alone. Especially after learning that he is alone in the galaxy as a Kryptonian, he still has friends on Earth. That's what Jimmy is for. It's always what Jimmy is for. Okay, I see what you mean. Oh wow, in 62 seconds, exactly. Good job. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for your Jimmy input. Catch you later for the, uh, for the thing. Yes. Yes, of course. The, the thing. I'll see you then. The Thing is another video which you should absolutely check out on LeBron's channel after this, which I happen to appear in. I think the death of Jimmy Olsen did serve a purpose, honestly. Five minutes into the movie, you knew that this movie didn't really get Superman. Because if this is the most interesting thing you can do with Jimmy Olsen, you've already lost. And if you are not going to do the most interesting thing in your movie, why even bother? In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Zack Snyder, the director of Batman v Superman, said, We just did it as this little aside because we've been tracking where we thought the movies were going to go and we don't have room for Jimmy Olsen and our big pantheon of characters, but we could have fun with them, right? Now, Zack Snyder doesn't want to make a movie with a proper Jimmy Olsen without that friendly face at the Daily Planet, then he does not want to make a Superman movie. He just doesn't. He wants to make a movie about a Superman-like figure who is not Superman. It would be like if someone wanted to make a movie about Spider-Man that doesn't just not feature prominently or even mention Uncle Ben, but where he's alive and a jerk and he dies and nobody cares. This isn't how the character of Superman works. Superman does not exist in a vacuum. The characters around Superman are as important to a story about Superman as Superman is. Without a friendly Jimmy or a plucky Lois or a 
kindly Kent parent, Superman is not Superman. Now, you can make a movie where Jimmy is not friendly, where he's some sort of antagonist maybe, but that's only interesting if in the larger context of the story he used to be friendly. Or he is going to be, eventually, because then we can explore what changes Jimmy and how that new Jimmy affects Superman. And you can make a story about a Superman where he doesn't grow up with his traditional friends and family members, two of the most well-known Superman comics, Superman Red Sun and The Nail, both explored that premise. What if Superman was raised under different circumstances? With a story like that, we can explore what makes Superman Superman. But those changes are informed by what this Superman is not. Red Sun is not interesting if you've never heard of Superman or Batman or Lex Luthor. Like, it's just some random comic. Context is what makes an Elseworlds story work. But Batman v Superman is not an Elseworlds story. It should be, because Batman kills and Superman isn't hopeful. But Batman v Superman is, without a doubt, a straight interpretation of the character set in the mainline universe. How can you tell? Well, because an Elseworlds story needs to have a pitch. In Marvel, these kinds of stories are known as what-if stories. The pitch is what defines the story. What if Wonder Woman was an Old West Sheriff? What if Bruce Wayne got a Green Lantern ring? And it, it's kind of one or the other. Either your story is a mainline traditional story about that character, or it's an Elseworlds version. And you may be wondering, well, what if you want to make a story that isn't quite about the normal version of the character, but also isn't really a what if story? Well, if you don't have the pitch and you don't have the purpose that comes with a what-if slash world story, then you're making the normal version, or at least you're doing kind of that. So then you hit the third option, the one Snyder should be working with and should have been working with from the beginning. You just invent a new character. You pull a Watchmen, the comic, not the movie, and you make some sort of pastiche. You make a new Captain Atom and a new Blue Beetle, Question, Peacemaker, etc. And that's what Zack Snyder wants. He wants to tell a story about a hopeless Superman, so we should just make his own. One that wouldn't need a Jimmy Olsen, because what's the point? Jimmy can't cheer Superman up or just believe in Superman. Batman v Superman is not just a movie that Jimmy Olsen could have worked in. Batman v Superman is a movie desperately in need of Jimmy Olsen. Because what is Batman Superman about? The central question is, should there be a Superman? Every character has their own answer. Clark. He's not sure. Lois is a yes, but seems to worry that Clark can't handle it. Lex and Bruce are hard nose. Diana doesn't even seem to care. The Senator isn't really on his side. And Ma Kent seems to believe that there needs to be a Clark, but maybe not a Superman. This movie has no character who genuinely likes Superman without also knowing that he is Clark. No character both does not know Superman's secret identity and likes Superman. And that's exactly what this movie needs. And I think you could accomplish it with like three scenes. The first would probably need to be Jimmy's introduction, since he's never been in these movies before. This should be in the Weekly Planet bullpen. Young, bright-eyed photographer Jimmy Olsen shows up to work with Clark and Lois. Jimmy's got a Superman mug and some pictures he's taken for the planet in a box. Perry walks in. Hey, Kent, I need you for a minute. This is Jimmy, Jimmy Olsen. He's been freelancing with us for a while. Got some great pictures of you-know-who. So we're going to bring him on part-time. I need you to show him the ropes. Then Clark and Jimmy just get some time to talk. Clark asks, well, where are you from? Jimmy is from Name Drop DC Comics City originally, but uh, I moved here with the dream of making it as a photographer in the biggest newspaper on Earth. I can't believe I'm here with the planet. So you uh, took pictures of Superman? You ever met him? No. No, I wish. Just from afar, like everybody else. Hopefully someday I meet him, but it's such a big city, I won't have that luck. You know Superman usually only meets people who are in trouble. People usually want to avoid that. Well, he'd save me. He's Superman. And this Jimmy completely believes that. He trusts Superman more than anyone Clark has met so far. He has no cynicism or anything like that. Clark gives Jimmy a tour, and at the end, Clark asks... So, do you have some friends in the city? Uh, not yet. This all happened so fast. <laughs> haven't, uh, haven't really had the time to make any. Clark like, takes a little pity on him. He's like, oh, well, um, if you want to grab a drink after work, I'd love to. Yes. Are you, are you sure? Yeah. I know what it's like to be the new guy. Plus, I've heard some crazy stories about Name Drop City. Oh, you wouldn't believe the half of it. 
Clark smiles, end of scene. Next scene comes after Clark's big public failure. Jimmy seems like he might be losing his innocence, but he's still on board. Maybe he also can say that he likes Superman more than Batman. Then the last scene. Superman flies over to the roof of the Daily Planet and just sits. He looks out at the city, sees the bat signal, but he isn't sure if he's really going to go through with this. Superman sighs, and then behind him, we see Jimmy Olsen. Jimmy says, oh my god, it's you. Oh, um, Superman, what are you doing here? Uh, sometimes I come up here to think. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Superman pauses. Jimmy steps in. Are you all right? Which is a crazy thing to say to Superman, but Jimmy is naturally kind, so he asks instinctively. Superman says, I just... I, I just want to help, and I don't know if I can anymore. They think I'm a monster, and I think they might be right. And then Jimmy does something crazy. He walks up to Superman, puts his arm on his shoulder, and says... Well, for what it's worth, I don't think you're a monster. And Clark smiles. Thanks. You're a good friend. And Jimmy says, We're friends? I'm friends with Superman? Clark realizes it's a mistake, but he also kind of likes it. He's like, Yep, that's right. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have somewhere I need to be. And then he goes to Batman. That's it. It's quick. It's small. But... It shows that there is some hope in this world, because there is hope in the world. That regardless of how much the Batman v Superman, Man of Steel, like regardless of how much that's the realistic take on Batman and Superman, there are bright-eyed, cheery, happy, hopeful people. And this movie about Superman more or less ignores them. Even though those are the people that need Superman the most, and those are the people that Superman needs the most. So, We've got the perfect candidate here in Jimmy Olsen. To quote a famous director, we can have fun with him. That is the purpose Jimmy Olsen serves, and that is why Batman v Superman desperately needed Jimmy Olsen. Oh, and one more thing, and this is a new thing. So in the past, I've talked about this video sponsor, Skillshare, an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. And usually when discussing Skillshare, I use two meaningful classes as examples. The first is fellow YouTuber Thomas Frank's class called Productivity Masterclass that helps you become more organized and productive. The other one is a class by someone named Jordy Vanderput, also a YouTuber. And the class is called Video Editing with Adobe Premiere Pro for Beginners. Well, I learned recently that Jordy put out a new class, Advanced Video Editing with Adobe Premiere Pro 2020. So I just started that class and I've already learned a bunch of new things. A lot of them are smallish things, some of which I am embarrassed to say I did not already know as someone who does this for a living. But either way, it is a really helpful class if you want to learn more about editing with Adobe Premiere Pro to make better videos faster. There are other classes in productivity, design, writing, so much more. You can learn and grow with short classes that fit your busy routine. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. And if you would like to join the millions of people already learning on Skillshare today, the first 1,000 people to click the link in this description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Explore new classes, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity with Skillshare's online classes. What you find might just surprise and inspire you. As always, I have to give a humongous thank you to everyone who continues to support the channel on Patreon. You guys are amazing. Also, gonna give a big thanks to Laron from Redis101. Go check out his channel. I have the link in his Twitter information and everything in the video description. I'm also in a video on his channel where we talk about how Civil War could have been more of like a Captain America 3 and less of an Avengers 2 and a half. It's a really interesting video. We had this really cool like three hour long conversation where we were just discussing like Zemo and what Captain America means in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And then we kind of distilled that into one pitch for a different Captain America 3, which it's a lot of fun. Definitely worth looking at. That's on his channel. Links below. 
Also, if you've ever thought about becoming a patron, now is a great time. Not only do we have the whiteboard videos and you get your name in the credits and stuff, we also do a monthly book club. Uh, this month we're doing Wonder Woman Earth One by Grant Morrison, and it's a very interesting book. I actually read it the other night. Uh, we're going to be talking about it and the Wonder Woman movie that'll be on HBO very soon. Listen to my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking, where every week me and my co-hosts DJ and Diggins pick apart a piece of pop culture by looking exclusively at the details. You can find us wherever you listen to your podcast. We are at Nitpicking Pod on Twitter. Oh, and my new merch store is now live. The link is in the video description. You can get your Nando V Movies sticker, your Nando V Movies enamel pin, which is very cool, the Nando V Movies pint glass, which is so great, and another thing that we're going to be adding soon that I'm very excited about that I've been, like, it's a thing that even in my house, I'm like, why don't I have more of these? Um, so you'll see what that is. That's like a little tease. Last thing, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I, on Twitter, there are like fleets now, which are basically like stories, and I've been using mine exclusively to fleet out when I'm having salmon for dinner. People seem to be responding to that. It's something that if you want to know when I'm having salmon for dinner, it's a good way to do that. That's all I got. Stay safe. I'll see you next time.